So thank you all for joining us. The one good thing about uh, the fact uh, it, that we are uh, quarantined or isolated or whatever is that we can do these kinds of events uh, the evening of a major snowstorm. So there's always a, something good about everything that's bad. Um, I want to welcome you. I'm your state senator, uh, and I have, uh, as all of the Senate has been, uh, working on this policing bill. Uh, I am on this evening with my good friend, Will Brownsberger. Uh, Will, amongst his other uh, things, is also the president pro temp uh, of the Senate, uh, and we work have worked together on this bill and other um, um, criminal justice issues for as long as, as I can remember. So, uh, and Will uh, was the head of the a conference committee for the Senate uh, when the bill got conference between the Senate and the House. Uh, so this is a first in the country kind of bill. I'm very, very happy and excited about it. Um, I do want to stop by saying this is being recorded uh, and it'll be a public recording. Uh, so for anybody that's asked, wondering that. Uh, also, it would be good to put in the chat uh, the questions that you have uh, and then uh, it, and it's going to be uh, shown, by the way, on, on my Twitter and Facebook. Uh, but if you have questions as we go along at the end, we are hoping to, we're hoping to be done by 7.30. We're hoping to have opportunity for people to ask questions. But if you put it in the chat, it might be easier. Uh, I can then read them uh, and we can uh, go for, from there. So I want to start with when... Um, this sort of all began, I uh, kind of feel like was there from the beginning uh, when uh, we all were uh, so aghast at the situation that we saw. Uh, I filed um, a bill uh, in the Senate that would uh, look at use of force, banning chokehold, uh, banning no knocks, the kinds of things that we saw and spent all that time watching on television, the thing that happened, uh, that the time that people uh, died as a result of the force that was exerted and was that excessive force. Uh, so I filed a bill uh, and then it was also filed in the House. From the beginning of the use of force, uh, the Senate president set up a committee to look at the whole issue of policing, the question of whether we should have an independent body who does a certification of police. What about decertification? What about the fact that there's been no, uh, you know, who punishes police? Do they lose their license? What happens in those situations? Uh, facial recognition, all of these issues. So the Senate president put together uh, a working group. I worked with the working group. Will uh, was the chair of the working group. Uh, and that as a result of that, we came forward with an omnibus bill by the Senate with regard to uh, the policing. The Senate passed its bill first, the House then passed um, a bill that also dealt with the issues of policing and excessive force and all of the things that you'll hear about tonight. Uh, those two bills needed to be reconciled and sent to the governor. Uh, and so there was a conference committee, Will chaired the conference committee and a bill came out of that conference committee that was supported by both the Senate and the House, and that is the bill that the governor had on his desk, and that is the bill that the governor has attempted to modify or amend, uh, and we will get into that later. So I, I'd like to introduce uh, my good friend, Will, who's so smart, so hardworking, so capable. I'm happy to work with him uh, and uh, have him do um, his PowerPoint and presentation, and what he's going to do is the bill that was goes to the governor. He'll then add in what happens if the, with the governor's uh, changes December 10th, his uh, amendments, but what his presentation is the bill uh, that came out of the legislature. So thank you very much, Will, for doing this with me in my district. Belmont's not that far, but on Zoom, no place is far. So. Well, no, delighted to be with you. And it is easy to travel these days. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you so much for your leadership, Cindy, on, these, um, on this whole space. Uh, you and I have worked together now for, as you said, a number of years, and you, you, you were a tremendous leader in the criminal justice reform of 2018. Uh, your, your, your fingerprints are all over that bill. 
and the same and the same with this policing bill. And I will highlight a number of areas where you've made uh, you know huge contributions to this bill. Uh, you know, as uh, on, on bills that you previously filed have been incorporated into this. So let me let me let me just go straight to a PowerPoint uh, to just give you a little an overview. Uh, so with a little bit of luck, I'm going to do this. So let me share screen and. Um, share this caucus presentation. And okay, that looks pretty good. Looks great. Uh, let's see if I can get it to... Um, uh, hmm, hang on a second. I needed to start responding. Okay, that that's... Oh, I got it. Okay. All right. So um, does that look good on everybody's screen? Yes. It's let, let me know if you need it bigger uh, or if it's cramped or something. All right, so the first major area of the bill is the area where uh, S Senator Cream's um, legislation uh, was directly plugged in on the use of force. I mean, Senator Cream filed legislation that was directly responsive to the, to the crisis that we faced this summer, uh, addressing the use of force in the street. And, um, we worked that over and it, it became a core part of what was in the Senate bill. And the House basically took what was in the Senate bill. So uh, that that um, set of concept that, that Senator Cream created, uh, you know, really became the foundation of the bill. So let's just go through what's in there. Uh, first of all, you're responding to the George Floyd situation. The bill does ban the use of chokeholds. Now, what is a chokehold? A chokehold is defined as some as actually trying to strangle somebody, you know, applying force to their a windpipe or, or uh, a carotid artery with the intention of or result of rendering them unconsciousness, unconscious or dead. And so that's, you know, it doesn't mean that a police officer can't grab somebody in a headlock in the middle of a fight or something. It's, it's not unrealistic. It's just saying you can't choke people to death, basically. Choking is very different from other ways that people might be uh, killed or injured. I mean, it takes a lot of time to choke somebody. Uh, and uh, you, you have plenty of time to think about that. And uh, you, you cannot do, we're, we're banning that kind of behavior. And that has happened. There was a, uh, we, we, we had the George Floyd case, but there was actually a Boston case where somebody was choked to a state of uh, serious unconsciousness and had sustained serious injuries. And that was a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Fortunately, the person did not die, but uh, su su suffered uh, some real uh, bad effects. Um, so that's, that's a good piece. Uh, a big emphasis on the bill is conceptualizing the uh, use of, uh, of de-escalation before for application of force. Uh, we and one of the things that I feel most strongly about here is the elimination of arrest or escape as reasons for the use of deadly force. Basically, you can't shoot somebody in the back if they're running away, uh, and that's you know that's if somebody's about to you know running away with the intention of hurting somebody else, then you can use a deadly force. Uh, in, if it's proportionate to the to the harm they're proposing to create, but uh, in today's world, that's a gray area, and I think that does lead to some of the police shootings. I mean, we, we you know if you think about some of the things you've read around the country, that incident down North North Carolina and other incidents, just the idea that you could shoot somebody for running away, uh, even that Jace Justin Root case where they chased him into the parking lot and all sh and shot him. I mean, it was more of an escape thing than anything else. And so I think this I think the the Thinking, the rethinking that will go on as a result of this legislation, I think will have an impact. Um, similarly, prohibit firing and mo moving vehicles. Now, one of the, this, this bullet here, this last thing about regulatory authorization, this is important. Well, a, lot of the things, a lot of the things that police said to us in the way of feedback was that, you know, hey, wait a minute, what if I, you know, the way you've written this, I couldn't stop a kid from throwing a brick through a window if he was about to do that. And so we said, look, we recognize that you need to uh, look at, um, develop kind of an inventory of situations that we don't have the ability to think of as legislators. So we create the ability for this uh, commission, which I'm going to come to, to uh, authorize minor uses of force in non-arrest situations. Um, a big, we, we also uh, were very uh, concerned about the, the, you know, the incidents that had happened in Boston and elsewhere of protests and police response. And so what we wanted to, the bill encourages people to engage in prospective de-escalation planning, to recognize when things are um, about to happen and engage with the event organizers to kind of get an understanding of what people are gonna do and hopefully keep things within uh, boundaries. Um, and when, if, if, if people do use, if the police do use crowd control tools like tear gas, 
that that's that's going to be uh, require a significant review in each case. So I think we're going to uh, moderate the use of force in crowd situations as well. Uh, one of the the um, an another one that I think is really big is this ban on no knock warrants. Um, today, in today's world, police can use no knock warrants, meaning uh, that they just bang through the door with no warning, um, to preserve evidence. So I've done, I've, you know, people, people, the police just you know, grab a battering gram and they hold it with, you know, six guys grab it and they just bang down the door. It comes down hard and they just run into the apartment. That way, nobody can flush the cocaine down the toilet. But we're saying, look, no, that is not a good, that's not a good enough reason to bang through somebody's door with the possibility of causing serious harm as has happened you know, more than once, uh, both in Massachusetts and elsewhere. You can only use warrants, uh, a no-knock warrant, if for some reason they're needed for safety and only a judge can issue them. You cannot just go into to the clerk's office and get one. So this escalates the, the I think we're gonna see a reduction in the use of no-knock warrants. I think police officers uh, you know, will have to change their strategies in some cases, but I think this will uh, make, make Massachusetts a safer place. Um, by the way, one thing just to highlight as I leave this slide is that uh, we are not addressing the issue of force in, in corrections. Uh, instead of those, that's a whole very different collection of rules and issues and people, and we're not doing it in this bill, but we are, uh, did, we did, we are contemplating doing it in the future and we created a commission on force rules in corrections. So that's the reuse of force category. It's a very significant category in the bill. The other really huge thing that we did in this bill, which I think is a nationwide uh, leading concept, is create a new statewide commission uh, with a, which is controlled by civilians and has extraordinary oversight powers. Now, ironically, we were actually kind of a laggard in this respect. We were one of only, I believe, four states in the country that did not have a statewide police officer and standards training commission. Uh, but we have, I think, moved to the front of the line with this legislation. Uh, the key things to highlight, I mean, this you can kind of see the, let me talk about the structure first, but the key things to highlight on this slide is number one, it is a civilian controlled commission. If you look at the commissions in every other state, they are all uh, comprised you know, of, of designated law enforcement officers. This does preserve a role for law enforcement officers. Uh, there's a chief, there's a, rank and, uh, there's a rank and file officer, and there's one appointed by the Massachusetts Association of uh, Minority Law Enforcement Officers. And the attorney general does have a role in appointing um, three of the commissioners and um, a joint role with the governor in appointing the another three. So that's another law enforcement connection. But we also have, uh, the, uh, except for those three designated ones, the other must be, must be civilians with no prior law enforcement employment. And we have uh, nominees uh, suggested, uh, picked off of lists by, prepared by Massachusetts Commission on Discrimination, National Association of Social Workers, and the Mass Bar Association Civil Rights Section. So I'm, I'm very confident that this commission is going to be a very strong voice uh, for change, while at the same time, I believe being fair to police officers. And uh, there's, there's two major kinds of things that this commission does, and they're reflected in, um, two, in, in, in the two different bullets on the bottom here, we, we, the two divisions that exist underneath it. Number one, there's a division of police training and certification, which defines standards uh, for training, for use of force, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then there is uh, subject to the approval of the overall civilian commission. And there, then there is an enforcement division, which will uh, re decide when officers can be certified. And in cases of misconduct, uh, that they must be decertified uh, or their um, certification suspended for a period or additional training. So there's a, there's a standard side and then there's, it's a little bit confusing because the standard side is, is there on the left. And then we have a division of police standards, but that's actually the enforcement side. So it's, it's unique in being heavily civilian, uh, but it's also um, not unique, but um, I, I think on the, on the top end of being strong in terms of its ability to receive complaints from any source, this is not a commission that depends on local action. If there is a department that is not doing a good job disciplining its uh, people, uh, its, its, its officers, uh, this commission can <clears throat> get involved directly, can hear a complaint from anywhere. It, is, it has subpoena powers, extraordinary audit powers, and it does cover everybody, including the state police. Um, 
it's a fair process. Uh, I won't go through the details on this slide. You can you can you can read as I talk. But basically, the um, there is a very well defined process which guarantees officers a fair hearing and of course the public affair hearing in that process, but nothing is gonna be done in a slapdash way. This is a sort of a fully developed uh, legal process that, or adjudicatory process where people will, um, well, everybody I think will get a fair shake. Um, it is, it's, it, one of the sort of wrinkles that we get into is the issue of to what extent is this about this collective bargaining rights and, and the civil service right appeal rights, which exist for police officers today, continue? And the answer is they do um, it, through a preliminary suspension stage. But upon final decertification, that is you, you've lost your license and there is no uh, collective bargaining or civil service appeal from that final event. Um, the post is... Uh, there'll be, there's a lot of disclosure built into that. I, and I won't take you through the details on this, but it's- so, intended... so you use POST as an acronym, so- Sorry, thank you. The POST is an acronym, which means Police Officer or Peace Officers uh, Standards and Training Commission. So I say the POST for short. Thank you, Senator Cream. Uh, <laughs> the POST, uh, there's a lot of dimensions of transparency within the POST, a lot of new disclosures. Um, and- uh, the um, so that's that's the, that's the second major area of reform. The third major area of reform we've we've gone through use of force. We've gone through the new new post commission. Third major area of reform is the governor's police um, the state police reforms, and I think those are significant as well. And we basically did uh, everything the governor had asked us to do in that in that space. They give him a lot more control, stronger discipline, and uh, a. a, a promotion process and hiring process that's designed to uh, give, give, give more opportunities for new people to enter into that culture and, and begin to change that culture. Uh, we made modest the, on the issue of court enforcement, of court enforcement of police con misconduct, which is a different issue from the administrative enforcement structures we've created. Uh, we've made what I would call more modest changes. We've made a modest change in the qualified immunity defense uh, which we can get into if people have questions about it. And uh, we did uh, speak to the issues of overtime fraud, uh, but those changes are not, not so dramatic. The, um, an area that was uh, important to many people was the issue of the school to prison pipeline, which is basically kids getting involved through their schools uh, in, the, in, the, in the criminal justice system where school discipline is done by officers instead of by teachers. <clears throat> and that's, so there's, there's, there is in this state, the concept of a school resource officer, which is a police officer in the schools. So this, this, this collection of ideas here is about uh, making sure that that officer has a clearly defined role, which is not routine discipline. Uh, so that there is not a phenomenon of kids getting uh, taken down to court because they started acting out in class. Uh, we want to minimize early involvement in the criminal justice system. Uh, we, we did ban racial, racial profiling, which is a core idea, believe it or not, that was not specifically banned in Massachusetts. And not only did we ban it, but we created an enforcement mechanism where if there's a pattern in the department, the attorney general can get involved. Uh, we did also fix a couple of uh, issues with the expungement language that we created in 2018. Now, a big thing uh, that was uh, been a big area of leadership for Senator Cream has been the issue of uh, biometric surveillance and facial recognition. It's a big concern of the American Civil Liberties Union. And uh, this is what Senator Cream has uh, uh, led in bringing this feature into the bill. Um, and basically the building does include a, a prohibition on public agency use of facial recognition, except in very limited circumstances. And um, you know, one of the themes that people talk a lot about as we talk about uh, police reform is shifting the kinds of responses uh, in the community uh, when when there's a problem. What do you how do, do police officers show up or does somebody show up that's more of a helping professional? And um, we don't shift resources in this bill, but we do further the conversation around mental health diversions in particular, uh, which is very important. Uh, there's a lot of situations where the right response is a helping response and just the presence of police officers on the scene 
may be absolutely necessary or it may be have a mixed effect. It may escalate a situation by alarming somebody who is in a state of crisis. So this is a, uh, there, we're gonna continue that conversation in some, in some additional and significant ways. Um, and finally, the commission creates a number, the bill does create a number of commissions and you know, sort of ideas that are, people are pushing forward. And I would highlight among them, the temporary commission on civil service to examine all aspects of hiring promotion uh, with the intention of, uh, of building a greater inclusion of uh, particularly people of color in, in the police workforce. So that is a summary of what's in the bill. And uh, Senator Cream, would you like me to stop sharing screen now or shall I leave that up for people for a little while and we can... Um, well, I think we should see if there are questions. Uh, I don't know how people feel about whether they want the sharing screen. You know what? Let me let me let me take it off. I think it's probably better if I take it off, and then we can all see each other, and uh, we'll have a better conversation that way. If needed, I can bring it back. Right. I think that's that's helpful. Um, so I know this was a a quick explanation. Uh, Will, could you um, elaborate on? Uh, so so it came back, went to the governor, and it came back from the governor. On December 10th, the governor made some changes. And if you want to procedurally go through uh, what that was, because that's really where we are now. Uh, right. Had some definitions. Uh, so I think we could spend some time talking about the changes at the governor. So in a procedural way, uh, it both passed both branches. The governor has amended the bill. We can uh, accept his amendments, we can reject his amendments. We probably, and the House probably has the votes to reject all the amendments, but the governor then has an opportunity to veto the bill. And that would require a different vote. Uh, and the vote in the House on the bill was pretty close. It may not be, the veto uh, uh, may not be available in the House. I don't know about the Senate at this point. Uh, so with that in mind, it's, it's, it is important to all of us that this bill ultimately becomes law. And so now we're in a situation with the governor where we can either say we don't want to have anything listened to at all and he can veto it and then we can perhaps lose the bill or we can look at his amendments and see if any of them uh, are acceptable. So maybe helpful, Will, if you went through those amendments, there weren't a lot of them. Uh, he didn't get rid of the, the post, as you call it, but he made changes. So if you feel comfortable talking about what those were in uh, his December 10th changes, that'd be great. Sure. Um, yeah, so I would say the governor's changes uh, in most respects are um, modest. Uh, I think he's accepted the, the, the premise of statutory use of force standards. He's accepted the structural uh, concept of a, of a post commission uh, with, with, with the membership substantially unchanged. Um, so I, I feel that the, the governor has accepted the broad outlines of the bill. Uh, what, what, what he is uh, focused on in terms of changes are number one, um, he as is, well, I won't go back to the slide, but you may have noticed that the, there were two divisions underneath the post. Again, one, about the one was the enforcement division and one was the division that sort of writes the training and the standards. Uh, and so currently there is a thing called the Municipal Police Training Council. And what we did in the bill is basically migrate that Municipal Police Training Council underneath the new post commission. Uh, the governor would like to keep it where it is, which is it would be within the Department of Public Safety, um, and so there's a whole sort of structure of, of relationships between the Department of Public Safety and the Municipal Police Training Council, uh, which is comprised of law enforcement. And then they have a staff, uh, which we had sort of put that underneath the post, but he's saying, no, I wanna keep that under public safety. You can have the post and the things that the uh, commission does, it will do, the, the, the uh, training council does uh, in the way of standards development, it will do in consultation with the post, but, we want to keep that uh, standards development function uh, within and training function within our uh, ambit. And um, 
so that's 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 a change which you know actually uh, the senate in its version of the bill had left it exactly that way so that is not a change that is out of bounds uh, to propose or consider because in fact that's the way the senate did it it was the house that had uh, that, that proposed folding it under and we we went along with that proposal from the house um, so that's that's the major structural issue there are some definition issues within the use of force standards. Uh, you know, they, I, I gave you kind of the high level of what those use of force standards are, but uh, there are some terms defined, like you know, what is imminent harm? I mean, if you say you can't go after uh, use deadly force except in case of imminent harm, well, what is imminent harm? And so, and those the definitions that we added, I think, are all very much calculated to uh, restrict use of force. I think the governor perceives them as perhaps overly restrictive of the use of force or hard to understand or put people at risk for being on the wrong side of them. Uh, so that's an issue that we're talking, taking a look at. Um, there are a couple of other definitions, issue, definitional issues around the issue of bias-free policing. Um, he did make one tweak to the membership of the post. Uh, we have a member that is a rank and file person appointed by the attorney general. Uh, they, he, he wanted to make say that that person would be somebody uh, from chosen from a list designated by one of the uh, leading union organizations, as opposed to just any law enforcement officer that the uh, attorney general wants to appoint. Again, not too, not too much of an out of bounds change. That language was in the original house bill. We went away from it, but it's been, it's been in the mix and he would like to go back to that. Uh, the area that's perhaps generated the most controversy is that he has uh, moved us back from the uh, concept of a, um, a ban on use of facial recognition and other biosurveillance techniques to basically a study of a ban on bio, uh, facial recognition and biosurveillance. So that's 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 generated a lot of com conversation over the past week or so, and that's something we're taking a look at closely. Uh, so we we the governor does have a lot of power in this situation, and we absolutely have to work with him. That we've heard, we've gotten some messages, which is you know don't work with the governor, don't you know, reject all his ideas. That is not an option here. We have to work with the governor or we will not get a bill. And this is a huge bill. Uh, no matter how you slice it, uh, it will have a big impact on policing. And um, so uh, that's that'd be my summary. There's uh, Senator Cream. OK, thank you. <laughs> I know that was quick and we did have some questions. But um, so let me go back into the chat and see. Um, uh, just a minute. Um, Diane McCurry had a question of what happens now with the Governor Baker's issues with the bill. Uh, uh, I wonder if that has been answered. Um, Diane, if you wanna uh, ask again, but I, it, it may be that it wasn't completely answered. Oh, th that was very good. But now I'm wondering what's the deadline for the legislature to get it back to the governor? Well, we don't have necessarily the deadline, but then he had some days you know, we have to still be in session and if we're gonna be able to override and we, we go out of session in the beginning of January. So we wanna be doing this quicker than, uh, sooner than later, because then we have, we do it first in the Senate, then the House has to do it. Then the governor will have some seven or 10 days for him to act or else it becomes, a, if he never acts, he vetoes it. So timing is of the essence. Uh, is Daddy answer the question, Diana? Um, yeah, but what what happens if that worst case scenario occurs? Do you have to start all over again with the bill? Or a bill? A once bill. once this session, once this legislative session goes out, which is uh, by I think it's January fourth or fifth, we're out of office. There's no bills; it doesn't go forward. So we would need to, somebody would need to file a bill, there'd be a hearing, it would go through the process, just like a brand new idea. And I, that would be a hearing and voted on, uh, and it may never look like it looks now. There are new people coming in and people going out. Uh, so I'm, I'm doubtful that it would be exactly the same bill that we have now. I mean, I know I'd be filing something and we'll be filing something, but how it would look in the end, I don't know. I think I think we're uh, will. I'm happy to jump into, but 
I think we're all of the mind that we'd like to work with Bill. Raise hand button to activate app. Input search keyword. Find the part. Can I ask a question? Wait, wait a minute. So can I was going by the chat and then I uh, can't do the chat. I'm blind. Okay. Can I can all right? Sure. So I just want to let you know. Me, I want to ask a question at some point. Sure. Can I just have your name? Lisa Stefani. Okay. I'm a public defender. I'm a CPCS post-conviction lawyer. Okay, good. I have a background in this area and I would like to uh, ask a question. What okay. is the next step besides police reform and criminal justice reform? Are you planning any other reforms? Um, I, I can speak for myself and Will can answer. Well, um, uh, uh, Senator Brownsburg is my, I live in Brighton, so he's my senator. All right, well then let, let's hear what he has to say first. Okay, uh, thank you thank for you. being a, a CPCS defender. We, he we, was a form, I know that already. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank From, you. Uh, Mr. Brownsberger and uh, his aides have told me that. Okay. Well, I, I, here's what I think. I mean, I think, look, I think this, this, people talk about, there's two ways of talking about uh, the whole issue of policing, at least two ways, there's many ways, but I want to highlight two. Number one, there's the whole reform approach, which is about making sure that we, so so to speak, address the bad apples, if you will, yes. the, the individuals who are misbehaving, and in some cases, departments that are very badly managed and not handling complaints uh, and you know, are allowing a lot of problems to, to continue, in fact, you know, have a bad culture. So those exist, both of those exist in Massachusetts. There's lots of wonderful officers. Uh, and I think this bill will support them. And I think officers want to do the right thing. Most officers want to do the right thing, but they, they want to know that when they escalate things, they're going to be supported in doing the right. If they you know, duty to intervene, they need to know that they'll be backed up if they report uh, misconduct by another officer. This bill is going to, I think is going to help to change culture and speak to the bad apples issue, if you will. Yes. Uh, I think, and I think it's really strong in that respect. It is not a bill that shifts resources. It is not a bill that looks at different ways of doing things uh, in the street. I mean, different kinds of responses to police problems, social work responses, mental health responses. Um, and it's not a bill that speaks to crime prevention more broadly and making sure that uh, people in poverty uh, you know, have what they need and are not drawn into crime. So I think the conversations that continue are conversations about what are the kinds of responses that we need to provide to incidents in the street. I think we always need police. I'm not somebody who thinks that, oh, well, we can get, uh, I'm not a police abolitionist. We do need to have a, a force response available uh, in, for, for many kinds of situations that do arise. Uh, and we can't, we can't sort of deny that or put our heads in the sand about that. But I think there's also some situations where a different kind of response might generate a better result. So we have to think about our response system. Uh, and so that that is part of the conversation that continues. And then I think there's a much broader conversation about crime prevention, which uh, and, and sort of supporting individuals so they don't end up on the wrong path, education, et cetera. And that's a that's not a new conversation. That's a continuing conversation. But we need to pursue that with continued uh, dedication and vigor. So can I jump in? Can I say something? Last question. Police Lisa. reform is part of criminal Lisa. justice reform. Lisa. Yes. Can I can I just jump in here too for a minute? Because sure. I have I have constituents here. So um, I'm going to answer your question in a different way. This to me this is a very very important civil rights bill but it is not the only bill that I expect and hope that we will be taking up in the next session. I have been very much involved in juvenile justice issues and emerging adults. Uh, and those are issues that I expect that I will be working on. Uh, I've been working with Will on prison phone calls. There, uh, this bill dealt with one piece of expungement, but there's other pieces and issues of expungement that we need to deal with. So. This is, this is just part of the roadmap to a broader criminal justice reform. That's what I was gonna say. I, this is one of the first steps that needed to be done immediately because it, it's more immediate to, the, to people who get in these situations with, with police officers, like my clients do. 
And I think it's a beginning step. It's a very good step. I've read the whole bill. I think it's a good bill. I've done legislative lobbying, so I understand you always can't get what you want, as they said, <laughs> as the Rolling Stone said, I believe. Yeah. I think it's a good first step. I think it's a pretty good bill, considering. Thank you for uh, that. Thank you. And Will Brownberger, I uh, I call your age all the time when I don't get paid. Uh, well, we 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 uh, Andrew Bettinelli's on the call, and yes, we, I, we, I've 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 dealt with him before. <laughs> Thank you. I looked who was on the call. I wanted to say hello to him. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. We're here for you. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for joining this Zoom. Yes. Um, so can I, um, I can, I'm going to move on to the next question, if that's okay, Lisa? That's, that's fine. I, I'm done. Okay, good. Well, you got anything you think about after just holler. Okay. So there was a question from Michael Sandman who's a, a constituent of mine, uh, who is a chair of the Brookline Advisory Committee. Uh, it was about downloading the a PDF of the PowerPoint. Uh, I think something went in the chat uh, from Andrew, uh, from uh, Senator Brownsberger's office with a way to pick, go and see the, with a PowerPoint and download it. But then there, uh, and, and so does that answer the question, Mike? Or did you have something else? Yes, that, that's fine. Thank you very much. I got it. That was Thank, quick. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> okay. Mary Sykes had a question about what is the bar to determine profiling? Will, do you, is that you still want that question, Mary? Yes, I do. Okay. Will, do you want to take a shot at that? You know what? I think that's a deep question, and I don't know that we, really have the, the, the great answers to that. Uh, we, we do have um, a, a bunch of data collection that is mandated as part of the cell phone law uh, in the case of automobile stops. Um, I think that data is just intrinsically extremely difficult to interpret. Uh, and so I think that's gonna be an ongoing problem. I mean, how do you, how do you make a case of racial profiling um, you now there's two different ways to talk about that. One is, okay, in a particular incident, was, was, was a person racially profiled? Well, you can go into that and you can probably get to the bottom of that. Uh, that's, and that's not so much about data, um, but you know, there's the potential for a lawsuit by the attorney general there, uh, or somebody can bring it up in the context of a police complaint. If one of, the bill does say that everybody's got a right to bias-free uh, professional policing. Um, then there's also this broader question of, you know, okay, well, if you have a year's worth of data and a certain percentage of stops and, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing, that's, that's again, hard to, hard to interpret statistically, and you're going to have a lot of discussion about that. And we do expect that discussion to continue, and we hope that it will, you know, highlight uh, things that people need to be thinking about, about how they're policing and, and moving people in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, okay. Let me um, go back into the chat. I'm sorry, I've tried to disconnect my telephones, but I'm not doing such a good job at that. So um, uh, let's go back to um, a question. Uh, wait a minute. Todd Boy, another one of your constituents will <laughs> so this would be a question for Will. Uh, uh, why did Mass not ban qualified immunity like Colorado? That's a great question. Uh, we've talked about that before. Um, Senate did a different uh, method of, of qualified immunity, and you can. Uh, why don't you answer that? It's your constituent, Will. Uh, sure. You know, well, I mean, I think it's I. We proposed in the Senate to substantially limit qualified immunity. Uh, we didn't end up doing that in the final conference. So that was not something that uh, we thought would, would be able to get through the House in a, fi in a final bill. Um, let's talk about what qualified immunity is just a little bit, because I think it's an area that is extraordinarily confusing. And believe me, uh, legislators get confused about it. In every conversation I've been in, there is confusion about it. I have done my best to understand it. I feel like I do understand it. And let me see if I can 
offer you my understanding in a nutshell. This is something that, by the way, is written out in more detail at the link where, that Andrew posted. There's some other materials there, and, and I've kind of drilled into this. But basically, qualified immunity is a doctrine that applies to weird new cases. It does not apply to the uh -huh. bread and butter police misuse of force case. For, and that's, that's not without, we don't have to change anything. I'm, I'm, I'm describing the current law. When a police officer engages in excessive use of force, that is a civil rights violation under federal law and can be sued upon and can be the basis of a lawsuit in federal court and routinely is. Um, the cases that in which qualified immunity comes up, again, are sort of strange cases where there was some strange aspect of it. Uh, a strange, one example of that would be there was a very unpleasant, you know, sort of horrifying case about a, you know, with a police officers pursued a fugitive or came into a, a yard looking for a fugitive. You know, there were kids playing in the yard. They ordered all the kids to lie on the ground. And there was a dog sort of roaming around and the police officer was kind of trigger happy and shot at the dog. Dog ran into the house and then sort of came back out again and was sort of sniffing around. And the, dog, the police officer went to shoot the dog, but shot one of the kids, shot one of the kids in the leg. And it's, it's a brutal sort of, you know, overuse of force case. But however, there was no actual intention to shoot the kid. It, it, was, it was no question that it was just an accident. I mean, it was a, and, and the court said, well, you know, is every accident a civil rights violation? Uh, if, if a police officer is driving down the street way too fast and, you know, and hits a, you know, a mother with a baby carriage crossing in a crosswalk, is that a civil rights violation? And the courts have sort of said, no, you know, we don't, we, we're not saying that everything is a civil rights violation. And we've created, and it, by the way, just to introduce it, the, the way the doctrine of qualified, community came, qualified immunity came up was back in the, uh, uh, it was in the Nixon administration when, Nixon had fired some people who were whistleblowers and they, they sued saying, well, the, the, you know, we were fired. Uh, it was a violation of our free speech. And the court said, look, no, it's an employment law issue. It's not a civil rights violation. You have we, we, it's sort of a qualified immunity concept to say not everything is a civil rights violation. So in, a, in the policing context though, most they, they, there's, it's well established that policing uh, excessive use of force is a civil rights violation. So it's not a weird new case where it's an extension of the law. Um, and there was a study done where, um, that showed in uh, that the qualified doctrine of qualified immunity was actually applicable in only something like 3% of a large sample about, about a thousand, some district court, federal district court cases. Uh, so my, my personal view is that we should uh, restrict the doctrine of qualified immunity. I favor doing that. I've argued for it strenuously, as is Senator Cream. We both favored strongly uh, limiting qualified immunity because it has inhibited the evolution of constitutional law. It has been overused. Uh, on the other hand, it's not what's uh, pr protecting officers from, from lawsuits in most cases. And so I, I think it's actually something that people have pushed a little too hard on both sides. I mean, the, when the police think, oh, that's gonna be the end of my, uh, of my financial security. Uh, you know, every time I, I do something wrong, I'm gonna get sued. Uh, or, you know, even that somebody says I did something wrong, I'm gonna get sued and uh, I'm not gonna have any protections. That's just not true either. Uh, the, the, the police officers have a lot of protection layers uh, that, that go, that are different from qualified immunity. They have indemnity. If, if somebody is uh, sued, if a police officer is sued, 99.5% of the time, the municipality is gonna pay, they're not gonna pay. And there's also a very deep tradition that's built into our uh, constitutional law that recognizes that officers do have to make decisions in the middle of the night uh, on a split second basis. Uh, they don't have an hour to consult their lawyer about whether exactly how to handle the situation. And so the courts kind of carve out a, a degree of latitude for officers that are making decisions in good faith. Um, and that's, that's part of our Fourth Amendment law. That's not qualified immunity. That's just a recognition of reality um, and that, that is built into our law. So I, I, the, long, the short of it is it applies to the small, a small number of cases. It should be modified, but we didn't get to it in this bill. So if I could jump in one other thing, which is sort of inside ball here. Uh, 
And if you are a lawyer and you're working on constitutional law or you've tried cases and you're defending people in court, you would have a different appreciation for the changes in the law in the cases that have made uh, qualified immunity not what it was originally. In order to um, override and have somebody found guilty, uh, they can invoke qualified immunity. The situation that would allow you to invoke qualified immunity has to be identical to the last case that was held on that. Uh, so if the dog is roaming and he, met, hit, and, he, and he shot the dog, unless there was another case with the same kind of dog roaming around, it, didn't, it doesn't fall into an exception to qualified immunity. On, on that note, this becomes very technical. And I think there are many lawyers who hope uh, that that qualified immunity will be fixed by the courts. That's not approaching it from the way uh, Will has, whether uh, or not police uh, should have qualified uh, immunity. It's just uh, a problem with the law as it stands now. I don't know if that was helpful, but it's just a different way to look at it. Ad, raise, ad, plus, ad, input, ad, please, and senior, ad, and light, left, ad, use the button. Ad, I, I, somebody, somebody, ad, you. Ad. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So the next question was from Courtney. Uh, did you get enough information about the governor's amendments? Is Courtney? Um, yeah, I'm here. Um, I would I I would love to actually hear a little more about that. Um, I know that a lot of folks have said that um, the changes are sort of taking a lot of the teeth out of the bill. Um, I know in particular the um, the civilian committee is really important. Um, in particular, because a lot of reforms um, are things that just because of, you know, the power of police and of police unions to influence things that um, even if, you know, a rule is broken, typically it, it there's no consequences kind of for that. Um, and so um, I think you gave a great explanation of um, what it actually is that um, Governor Baker wants to change, but I would love to sort of hear more about how the how, not just the what, I guess is one way to put it. Um, so, so like what would be the, the impacts of those proposed changes in terms of what it would be possible to sort of do under this law? Um, okay, so I, uh, I'll say something and Will, but I'm sorry, can I just interrupt you for one second, Courtney? There were people on the call that I really wanted to introduce in case they can't be there. Uh, stay with us. So uh, we did talk, hear from Michael Sandman, who chair of the Brookline Advisory Committee, um, Alicia Bauman, who is uh, one of our well-known counselors in Newton, is on the call. Um, I saw that Brian Barish was here, and he is works for Senator Chandler, and he helped work uh, with amendments on the laws. Uh, so I wanted to give him a shout out, uh, and I. <coughs> know that Alice Peisch is trying to get on the call. Uh, she had to be in the State House today uh, because they ran a House session. So I just want to give a shout out to those people. Back to your question, Courtney. Uh, I'm going to say something and then let Will answer it. But to me, the biggest change was the, uh, the change to uh, facial recognition. Uh, and there were some changes to definitions. Um, but the question is, the independence of the board still exists uh, and the change uh, in, in the training is not as big. Uh, I always felt that uh, um, the problems with uh, right now that we have with facial recognition are really uh, civil rights issues and it's really racial profiling. And I have been trying all year to get some ban or some uh, thing to do with with uh, facial recognition. So I personally hope that we find some middle ground uh, on that particular issue. It, it's very important to me. Uh, Will, why don't you hop in on the um, uh, interpretations of the uh, other than the facial recognition? Thank you. Uh, well, you know, it's 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 a deep it's a deep issue. Um, to, I think that. One of the things that we do as legislators is we worry about exact words, right? We get balled up about 
you know, exactly whether is, is something supposed to be in con consultation with you know, somebody or is, do they have approval authority? Uh, and, but in reality, um, I think when we create this commission, it's gonna have enormous visibility and power uh, and that um, I think it's gonna have a huge influence even if we accepted everything, you know, putting aside the uh, facial recognition thing, which is a different conversation, even if we accepted everything the governor did, which is not my preference, but even if we did, we'd, have, we'd still have an extremely strong commission. This is, it's a civilian controlled commission. It has the ability to hear complaints directly. It has the ability to subpoena. It has the ability to audit uh, police departments. And so it has a very sweeping mandate. Now we're, we're, we're a little worried. We think these use of force rules are important. We've given the, um, you know, we've created this uh, regulatory ability to moderate the use of force rules. By the way, that regulatory ability to limit the use of force rules only does not apply to deadly force. So these, these worries about, um, you know, who's controlling are, a little, are, are more about non-deadly force. Uh, so they're a little bit lower profile. Um, I care some about the amendment language, but um, I, I, what I think is that ultimately um, it's the visibility of the commission, it's the authority of the commission to investigate. None of that is, is endangered by anything the governor has done. The governor has accepted all of that. Uh, so I personally feel that we have an extremely strong mechanism, which it's very important for us to get that in place. We need to work with the governor and get, get to end of job in a successful way on this. Um, and so that, that's how I feel about it. Okay. That, is that, does that answer your questions? I mean. Sure. Um, I have I have a quick follow up, but um, after that we can move on to other folks so they have a chance to talk. Um, I'm wondering sort of, um, so a lot of these changes are kind of happening at the state level and I'd love to hear about how these changes could affect sort of the possibility for change in our own communities um, and I'm based in Newton, um, so if um, Senator Cream wants to respond to that, um, feel free to go for it. I, I'm not sure I'm following what your question is, so when you say these changes. I'm not, I, I, I start again. I don't know if sure. I follow them. Okay. So, so for example, if, um, if we're looking for changes within um, the Newton Police Department, for example, um, are there new possibilities that are opened up by this legislation, or is this, you know, mostly something that just affects um, state level, not sort of town or locality oh, okay. level changes? Yes, I right. I get I get what the question is. Uh, so this is not. It will affect every municipality because they're police in this state. And if there's excessive use of force or the chokeholds, the police in Newton will be bound by this legislation as well uh, as everyone in the state. So from that respect, it applies. But if you think that this legislation may change the hiring practices or defunding police or out of that, that is more of a local issue. Was that helpful to your answer? Yeah, that was very helpful, thanks. Yeah. And I know that there are, there is a group, there are a group of um, uh, counselors, Alicia might have some response to this, <laughs> but that are working on uh, a group that are working on whether there'll be changes to the way uh, things are done in, in Newton with regard vis-a-vis -vis the police department. I'm not involved in that and that might be a separate uh, issue that they are working on. Um, uh, Alicia, I don't want to put you on the spot. So no, not at all. Um, so Courtney, I don't know if we've spoken before, but I am on the Public Safety and Transportation Committee, which does uh, have oversight for the police department. And as you probably know that there is a current uh, uh, police reform task force that's happening. And we are having um, a meeting with the police reform task force at Public Safety in January. So if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to a Bowman at newtonma.org. Uh, in newtonma.gov, sorry, I'd be happy to chat um, more with you about that. And, um, but I do wanna follow up with uh, uh, Senator Cream's comment, the police review board would review. So if there was a police officer in Newton that, that had, uh, uh, um, whose conduct needed to be reviewed, would that not be reviewed by the state board? Yes, yes, that's okay. what I so that's 
you know, I think that's something that's really critical. I think, you know, it's the most important thing, I think, in the whole bill, Uh, that facial recognition. But to me, that's the most important because it's, it keeps everybody honest if you're able to really have a a thorough review of of officers and hold them accountable. By by an independent body. An independent body. So, but Courtney, please reach out to me and I'm happy to chat with you more about that, okay? Sure. Um, I, yeah, I'm actually part of Defund NPD, and so we we do a lot of work with you. Yeah, unfortunately, the public task force meeting is actually at the same time as this meeting tonight, so we kind of had to uh, divide and conquer. But um, but thanks I, for your answers. I appreciate it. I think Courtney, you were on a call with me. Uh, Probably or, or, that's right. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, yes. Yeah, so the police, if there's any uh, police that do bad things in Newton, Brookline, Wellesley, or any any community. Uh, they're going to fall within this board. So, okay. If you need any other questions, you get back to me too. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so Diane had a question and, and I guess Courtney did too. Um, so it was, it was respect to uh, what is the deadline for returning the bill. So when we give the bill back, the governor has 10 days to sign or veto or go into a law without his signature. If he chooses to veto, we would need to override before the session ends, which is January 5th. So we have to send it to the governor more than 10 days prior to the 5th, or there is a possibility that he could sit on the bill past the 5th, resulting in a pocket veto. Was that too confusing? And uh, someone mentioned the 26th. So it's the 26th, 10 days before the 5th. Uh, did, did I answer your question, Diana and Courtney? Um, good on my end. Okay, great. Uh, and Court, yeah, Courtney was interested. All right. So there's a question from Sue McKaylee, uh, McKaylee about the facial recognition mean that'll be not used to be able to use until the study is done. You want to take that, Will? I'm, I'm sorry, which were the, the question again, please. I'm sorry. So the, the, you're, I think that Sue, you're talking about in the governor's amendment. It, I think you're asking, will study of facial recognition mean that it will not be able to be used until the study is done? No, uh, that, that, it, that would be the big change. Uh, the facial recognition could be used. And then there would be some commission that was kind of weak and we don't know what would ever happen and whether anybody would ever look at the findings of the commission. So I think you hit, on my part, I think you hit the nail on the head. Will, you might want to add something. No. Was that, did that answer Sue or did you have something else? Okay. Um, Todd, is in Will's district. Did you uh, get your, Lisa's, did you get your answer? I don't know if Todd's gone. Uh, David Rockwell, are you here? Alert, audio now unmuted. Can I ask um, Senator Brownsberger? All right, what, who is, is that? this the first step of criminal justice reform in the state? I'm sorry, uh, who's speaking? This is Lisa. Oh, Lisa, right. Okay, what were you gonna I'm ask? the public defender. <laughs> yeah, right, you, you got another uh, question. I'm a post-conviction. Uh, um, what other steps are you guys doing with, within criminal reform in a broad sense of the word? I, I thought I answered <laughs> that by the juvenile justice, emerging adults, phone calls in prisons and other stuff that we'll be filing uh, come the next session. Your okay, meeting. thank you. Okay, David Rockwell, are you still here? I can speak, this is Ann Auerbach. I can speak for David, whom I know. Okay, uh, good, go for it. We're part of United Parish in Brookline. And so what he had asked was whether, is there some uh, mess given, well, what she says obviously is uh, Senator Brownsberger's comment must uh, that the House and Senate must work with the governor's changes. What is the best message that we as constituents can send to our senators or representatives? Well, 
It's got to be quick because we don't have much time. I guess the most important thing you can say if you feel it is that this bill has to pass it even if it's not perfect. That there's a lot of great things in here. Uh, my hope is that we can put some teeth into uh, the uh, rejection of facial recognition. But um, this is a great bill. We're the first in the nation to do a lot of these things. And uh, we just got to get it done. I mean, that would be my message. Will you can hop in if you have a different message or whatever? No, my Thank message you. is we, we've got to get it done, yeah. Can I can I add my question, which is down a little bit further? Okay, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Last night with MCAN, which is Massachusetts Communities Action Network, uh, and the ACLU, and they are adamant that they're not that we're about the facial recognition thing, as they said. Until if it becomes a study, my sense is if it becomes a study, then it's like it'll go into Never Neverland and racial profiling continue. I and, agree. And what's very noticeable about this meeting and last night's meeting is that there were many, many, many people of color on that. And I think that that, and I think that that brings a, that brings that aspect to it. And I think that we really, um, they, they were, they would let all the other stuff go <clears throat> as long as this one was held on to, because they said, as it is, you can use specific, you can use it anyway, when it as needed. But I, I totally, I totally agree. And this is the most important piece of the governor's amendments. Yeah. And um, facial recognition, uh, this issue is something that I filed at the beginning of the first year. Very excited that it was in. So. This is the most important piece. Is there something that we can do to 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 address? Write to the governor. Oh, I have, but I... I, mean, I think it's. I think that each individual legislator. I mean, I guess you could write to everybody if we get a deal that that they need to work. Hey, Lisa, can you put your thing on mute? It's okay. I will. What they suggested is we we that we write to Speaker DeLeo and um, and Karen Spilka, yeah, uh, because they're the ones who are doing the negotiating. Um, right. But um, I, it just seems so important that. Uh, hey, I, hey, Cindy, I, I, I just want to make sure you, you said something. You said this is the most important thing. What you mean is this is the most me. important thing about <laughs> the about the governor's amendments, right? Right, right, right. Yes, I'm sorry, Will. This is. Not the most important thing in the bill. This is, to me, this is the most important thing to focus on trying to work to change from the governor's amendment. Yes. yes. The, the, the other, I think people can lose sight of the scope of this bill. I mean, there are, this speaks to police violence. Um, we've got, you know, hundreds of young men um, shot every year in this country. The New York Times uh, did a story in June about racial profiling, I mean, about the um, facial recognition about, about a young person of color who'd been wrongly profiled as, as through the facial recognition. But what they said in the story was, this was the only one, the only case that they could document of that actually happening. So it's an important issue. It's a future oriented issue. It speaks to civil rights in a broad way. Uh, but compared to addressing police violence of a lot of other forms, and by the way, uh, addressing police procedures of a lot of other forms, there are hundreds of documented cases of people being misidentified by eyewitness identification. And so we, there's legislation on the issue of eyewitness identification, which we need to address, and it does have a racial dimension as well. So I think it's, a, it's an important issue, but we have to keep in perspective that this bill is a home run out of the park on the issue of reform and addressing police use of force, Senator Cream's use of force legislation, which is in the bill and which is not really being contested by the governor, is a huge step forward. And so is the post commission. Uh, you know, it'll be a national model. So we have to get this bill done. We have to do as well as we can on the facial recognition, but we have to get the bill done. And to some other, another question that was in the chat no, we do not have the votes to override this. If the governor says no, as he has said he will. 
uh, you know, we, we have to work with him. If we ignore his considerations, we will not have a bill. So we have to work with him to the best, to get the best thing we can. In the, in the House, they didn't have the votes, and, and we would have to see if we still had it in the Senate. Um, yeah, I think we probably do have the votes in the Senate, to be clear. I, I agree with Senator Cream. We probably still have the votes in the Senate, but I don't, but we know we don't have the votes in the House. We've never had the votes in the House. Right. So um, there was a, uh, Todd, did you get all your questions answered? I did, Senator. No, thank you. And I, I just made a point to make sure that we um, answered Michaela's question because I thought it was a really good one. And I know that we had talked about, you know, really highlighting um, people of color's voices on these calls. So I just want to make sure that that was addressed. Okay, I think we did, right? There was an op-ed, a uh, great editorial piece from the players, the Celtics players on facial recognition. I don't know if anybody saw that. They all signed on. Uh, it was a great piece. It's on boston.com uh, addressing the racial profiling on, on facial recognition. Um, so is there anybody who has a question, didn't get a chance to answer it, that we didn't, they didn't get a chance to ask it? So, so my question was specifically about addressing um, white supremacy or so-called racism within the police department. Like that's such a huge part of this. And I just don't see it in writing. And I don't know if it's the fear of putting it there, but I'm just curious because that's a huge part of the whole thing is, is the, it, with the, with the racial profiling and everything is, is, is that, that aspect. Of, of, of what we've been grown up to call racism. And, yeah. and I'm curious how, exactly how we're addressing it. So we're addressing it with citizens councils and how does that get inside the police departments and, and make change? Training. So, so, well, I think this, uh, Senator Green, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Will, go ahead. I, I think that I think it's a great question. It's been very, very front and center in our minds as we've thought about the bill. Um, there are a few different levels of answer to that. Uh, one is we've wanted to make sure that the commission itself would have uh, representation in people of color. And, and one of the things I didn't say is that specifically the language does say that it should have proportional representation of people of color. We do have one commissioner who's going to be designated by the MCAD or from a list of people designated by the MCAD. All the members of the MCAD are people of color. Uh, the commissioners of the MCAD are people of color. We also have the members designated by the National Association of Social Workers, likely to end up being peoples of color and the Massachusetts Bar Association, Civil Rights Association. So I think we, civil rights section. So I think with the commission itself, there's a very strong likelihood that people of color will be uh, very well represented on that commission. And I think that's the most fundamental and important thing uh, the and when, it, when you say proportional, you mean proportional as opposed to saying that, okay, so there's say 8% African-American people in Massachusetts or the, the, the huger percentage of those that are going to be arrested in, because, because there's, you know, there's a lot more than the percentage. I mean, we have a higher rate. Yeah, you I'm got talking. it. You got it. No, you're right. Um, and so there are two layers there. The, uh, the one that's, that's that I use the word proportional, and that really does speak to population, not to the, the prevalence. But then there's the other layer, which is the specific uh, appointees and the source of the appointees that I think will end up guaranteeing a strong representation. Um, so the, so there's, there's that level of it, uh, which I think is the top level and very significant. Then there's just all the, there is the ban on racial profiling. There is the statement in the bill that everybody has a right to bias-free professional policing, and uh, that's that's a, and that that the all the different concepts of misconduct, you know, are going to be viewed through that prism if somebody's uh, you know using force in an appropriate way. The things that people do that are inappropriate to people of color are things that are going to be specifically banned by the bill. So, I mean, that are that oh, excessive use of force and so forth we're gonna to speak directly to those. 
So to the extent they have a disproportionate impact on people of color, the people of color are going to disproportionately benefit from the increased accountability uh, throughout the police force. Um, so, and then the last layer is there's a bunch of training mandates as well that speak to um, you know cultural sensitivity and, and and that. I'm sorry, Cindy. No, I I we gave the AG uh, a power if she believes there's a patent exists to bring civil actions for appropriate equitable to eliminate the pattern of practice. So we did give her some power as well here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, um, you're right. It, there is a problem and it does exist. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing it as best we can, but it's gonna take, it's gonna take a lot, a lot of years of how we think about things uh, to make change. And it, you know, and, it, and, and to be honest with you, it's got to be front and center in the language. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be front and center in the language. I realize you guys are sort of cramming this through and rushing this through, but oh, it, you, know, we can't, you, you, you really can't make that much change without putting right. it right front and center in the language. Well, we worked with the Black and Latino Caucus. We worked with the NAACP, we worked with a lot of groups to get language here that they felt comfortable with. So um, I understand. So we uh, were really, we, we didn't do this in a vacuum, but okay. I can't, you know, but, but we're, we're looking forward to any help anybody can give us. You're right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Appreciate your question. Uh, any, anybody else that we didn't quite get here? Uh, okay, well, I want to thank you all for on board, and uh, we're all here, whether it's me uh, in my district, Will in his district, or the city of Newton, and Alicia Bauman, who's been on this call. Um, we're, we're here to answer any questions that you still have that you didn't get answered, and, and thank you all, and stay safe and stay out of the snow. Uh, and uh, look forward to doing um, another Zoom uh, on another topic. And thank you, Senator Brown, for uh, this was great. And I so appreciate your uh, willingness to do this with me. Thank you so much for having me, Senator. Okay. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night.